the gentle mentor. You, you grew up in Republic. You're born in Republic. You grew up in Republic. So that's the, for those of you who don't know, that's the suburbs. Are there really suburbs of Springfield? There's not really suburbs of Springfield. Not just really. the small little towns outside small of Springfield. Town. Yeah. Yeah. I was just driving through Nixa today and I told my son as we were driving through Nixa and we drove to the Nixa high school or right by the Nixa high school. And I said, you know, Nixa high school, that's where Jason Bourne went to high school. He was like, who's Jason Bourne? <laughs> oh, I was like, oh no, I oh, failed no. as a parent. I haven't yeah, skipped driving Jason by Bourne Brad Pitt's house. <laughs> I, I think that's your fault though, Mark. It is. It is my fault. I, I, that's what I said. I failed as a parent. Yeah. My son doesn't know who Jason Bourne is. Yeah, exactly. Uh, anyway, yeah, that's, you, so you grew up. You grew up in Republic of Springfield area. What? Um, what? What was? What was your? What was your family like? What was? Uh, as you were growing up as as a teen, what was? What was that like as a young child? Um, I guess for me, you know, I had I had had and have wonderful parents um they were always kind and loving to me and would would do basically anything to um to help the family and so i i grew up without you know any horror stories or anything my dad was a very hard-working person and my mom stayed at home and you know and loved and cared for all of us but um I, I did grow up kind of interestingly because uh until probably i was about 12 i never I never spent the night anywhere. Um, I never really went anywhere. In fact, um, until I was around 12 or 13, my, my playground was my front yard, my backyard. And then a little bit, we actually grew, I grew up, we lived in the, um, the pastor's house right next to a church there on main street. It's no longer there, but that's where we, uh, that's where we grew up at. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I grew up literally, literally right next to a church and um, we we just didn't you know we just didn't go to church there wasn't anything about church that seemed appealing to us I guess uh, but but basically that was my playground I never went anywhere I never went on any vacations um, the big thing was when we'd go to Walmart that was up on sunshine uh, that was like the outing that was as far mm -hmm. as I had ever gone until I was probably around 16 or 17. So pretty isolated. Um, I was extremely, extremely shy. I mean, to the point of I, I wouldn't, you know, wouldn't say words to anybody if they would even ask my name. I'd just kind of like look at you, <laughs> stop and stare at you. Um, just cripplingly shy, I guess, is, is kind of what I would say, which is interesting because now I can, you know, talk a little bit, but I'm still very much an introvert and I, I don't. You know, I don't like to be the center of attention, but it's funny because I will, I learned how to use that skill uh, in my childhood to be able to um, to to kind of take care of my mom. My mom um, definitely had some some things going on. She you know she didn't go out of the house. Um, she didn't have a driver's license. She didn't go anywhere. So I from a pretty early age I developed a, a codependent relationship with my mom, which of course I didn't know what that was at the time, but basically right. she was sad. I was sad. She was happy. I was happy. And it was my job to make her happy. And it, nobody told me to do that, but I wanted mm -hmm. to do that. You know, mm -hmm. I wanted to, to make her feel good. And so, um, you know, she had, she had lots of things that she could have really probably benefited going through a recovery program and working through those things. But she, just had no interest in them. And it was just, you know, again, at that time in our lives, I had no idea what was going on, but you know, those are just some small things um, that really impact your life though, when you're young and you don't really realize what's going on. I think the biggest thing is of course, I, I didn't have Christ in my life at the time. So the world was my oyster. Um, anything about the world, the world was important to me. Money was important to me. Things were important. Um, and through all those things, I learned that I would do pretty much anything to get those things. And if that meant, you know, through, through my relationship with my mom, and then I had some things help, happen in my childhood that I, I basically just thought I was a bad person. I thought I was an evil person. And as I started going through that in my life, uh, I started to adopt that mentality because no one ever told me anything different. I never got any help for that. So 
as I was going through, I found power in being an evil person. I found a way to control my outcome. And so mm-hmm. that was kind of moving into, you know, 12, 13, kind of in that space where, you know, I'm angry at the world. I'm angry that I don't have a million dollars, that my parents aren't rich, that, you know, I don't have every single thing that every kid has at school. And, um, you know, just to the point where the, if it wasn't stuff or, um, you know, affirmation for me, which was kind of my drug, I, I couldn't get enough of your, your, your good, you're doing good. Um, which again, uh, later on, I turned into something, you know, that evolved into the golden boy complex, but through that codependent relationship, but that was later on, but basically, yeah, that was kind of it until, until about middle school. So. <laughs> Interesting. So, so what, so what happened that, that kind of turned you into that golden boy complex that you have? Or that yeah. You so had? as I kept going, um, you know, as you get older, you start to notice things that you want that might not be things, but more like, um, I, I think just, um, alcohol and drugs and girls and, you know, things, you know, pornography and, and whatever else you can get your hands on. Uh, but I yeah. still wanted my parents to think that they had a great son. And so you start living this double life where, you know, in front of them, I didn't curse, you know, and I didn't curse for a really long time, but, you know, in front of them, I didn't curse, you know, I didn't do any of these things. And, and all these things, I tried to keep this, uh, this mask uh, on for each person. And so as a, as I grew up and as I continued to do these things, one, my overwhelming desire to have those things or to have whatever it was. Um, I took those skills that I learned when I was young about how to take care of my mom and make somebody happy and do the, and do these things for people. I turned those into manipulation techniques. And so I was able really easily to read people because that's what I've been doing my entire life. So I learned how to read you and what you needed and what your facial expressions meant whenever you did a certain thing and how you stood and how you acted. And it's not like I just stood there and, you know, gawked at you, but I certainly was absorbing all this information. And so I simply fell into the way you talked, what you talked about, what you started out with, uh, how you approached me. Are you the life of the party? Are you quiet? If you're the life of the party, I'm, the, I'm your follower. I'm your supporter. If you're quiet, I'm bumping you up to make you feel important. And again, I, as some of them, it wasn't meant to be, you know, I wasn't being evil, but I certainly used those tools to get what I wanted. And using those things, uh, especially against people, you can't, can't do that very long and not really. And first of all, at this point, I don't even know who I am. I'm an amalgamation of what the world is telling me I am, what the world is telling me I should have, what this brokenness is inside of me, this whole of Christ, which of course I didn't know what that was. Um, this, this deep need for affirmation and, and, and care and, and just needing to be good because I didn't find myself to be a good person. And not even a good person. I, I knew I was desperately evil, but I didn't know what to do about it. So to fill that hurt and to fill that void, I wanted people to tell me that. So I would tell them whatever I needed to tell them to get me to tell them that. Um, and then ultimately, all this just went into a black hole, you know, so it, it doesn't go anywhere. It, it never filled me up. It would just would go into a black hole. So as I was heading into my teenage years, then, yeah, it just kind of turned into one of those, uh, the golden boy where... I wanted to be everything. So, you know, if I knew you, Mark, and you, Doug, and I knew you guys separately, I would spend some time really getting to know who you were. And maybe I didn't really like sports, but I would talk a little bit about sports just so I could belong, you know, or something like that. Now, this is an example, but, you know, something where I had something with you at a, at a bare minimum. And, and some of it was genuine. You know, it's not all, again, it's not all evil, but it was definitely to drive my, my need to have 
people around that were, you know, like excited that I was there or, or whatever the case is. And, and I think ultimately what I was doing is I was recreating codependent relationships. I didn't know that at the time, of course. Uh, but I'm, I'm just, I'm reproducing all I know. And so um, I became whatever my mom needed at that time to make her feel good. Well, I became whatever you needed, Mark, and whatever you needed, Doug. But the problem is, what happens when Mark and Doug get together? What if I told them something differently? Mm-hmm. What if I'm one person around Mark? What if I'm really your follower, Mark, but Doug, I'm, I'm your supporter. Now I'm two different people. And now when I put you together, now that's where the lies start. Well, I thought you did this. And well, yeah, I mean, I do, but I, I also like this. Oh, what? what now? What now? And that's when you just start making up these worlds and it just compounds upon one another. So, so anyway, lying became something that was um, just second nature. I mean, I had lies so deep. Um, and, I, and unfortunately, someone that can attest to this and certainly even probably give a better uh, examples of it than myself would be my ex-wife. But the lies that I dug in the, the, the worlds that I created to get what I want out of my sinful nature and to still meet those desires. Cause I didn't want to give up, you know, I mean, I have a girlfriend, but I didn't want to give up lusting after other women. So to get those, I would lie to everybody. I would lie to the people I was lusting after. Oh, yeah, and of course, no, I don't have a girlfriend or whatever. I would lie to my girlfriend saying, oh, no, of course I was at Bob's house. Well, now I need to make sure that Bob was doing something that would, you know, let us, you know, sync up with whatever it is that I told her. And it gets really complex, really, really fast. And you spend an awful lot of time Ultimately, what I would say is I spent an enormous amount of my life in a fantasy world. So most mm-hmm. people wouldn't attribute, uh, you know, living uh, lie to lie or just in absolute misery because I, I was a miserable person. I was absolutely miserable mm-hmm. um, as really a fantasy. You know, you think of fantasies as something great, but nothing in my world was really real. Mm. Um, it was fabrications of whatever this version of Jason was to this person and still not knowing really even who I am. So again, that kind of led in after high school and, um, that duplicitous uh, tension is so destructive. What's that? The duplicitous tension is so destructive when you're in that cycle of living those two separate lives. You can, it's like, it's tearing you apart. I always think of Jesus talking about the new wine and the old wine skins. And I uh, used to explain to kids about like walking on a fence. You know, you know what happens if you walk on the fence long enough, something bad's going to happen. And that's why you shouldn't do it. But that's that, that two, two things trying to share the same body kind of a deal. You know, and yeah. they're, they're pulling against each other. That's that's yeah. so internally destructive. Absolutely. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I just wanted no, to. That, no, that was a great interjection. And in fact, I would even add to that. So I would even think of it as like a spider web. So I would think of it almost as pieces of you are actually getting pulled in multiple dozens of directions. Mm. Well, if that's the case, there's no you left. Yeah. Fragmentation. There, Yeah, there's nothing. There, You, do, you don't even really exist. So anyway, so then so got- all of this, so all of this was kind of developing and festering itself in your, in your personality and in the way you worked, even before you started getting into the things that you were addicted to, right. Even before just, just relationship wise. Is that, is that correct? Um, no, I was, no, I was fully addicted to stuff during this time as well. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I didn't know. I was, okay. Yeah. So yeah, I was an alcoholic for sure. Um, I mean, I love doing drugs. Again, when you're when you are living a fantasy or a false life, emotions can have a real unfortunate effect on you. Mm-hmm. And it's it's called the conscience, right? I mean, that's what God uses to help us to understand. I mean, He embedded that moral law in each one of us. Well, it it, it can come really a, a big problem when you're trying to manipulate everything. And so what you do is you deaden that as much as possible. 
Um, and so I found just shoving feelings down, shoving emotions down, not dealing with basically conviction that was coming up. But then I discovered as I got deeper, I discovered alcohol and drugs and, and different ways that I could deaden it even further. Um, and then later in my life, it actually, I thought that alcohol became my way to tap into those emotions because I became so dead that I couldn't feel anything. Mm. I could do horrific acts. Um, you know, I, I cheated on my wife twice. And yes, I felt bad, quote unquote, I felt bad, mm -hmm. but my actions told differently. I didn't mm -hmm. repent. I didn't change. I kept doing exactly what I was doing. And so you can deaden something to a certain point, but you can do horrific acts. I, I think probably one of our best of this, this century is, is Hitler. I mean, we look at Hitler and we're just like, how could any one person do those horrific acts and carry those out. And it's just, if you believe something enough and deaden that conscience enough, you can do unspeakable horrors. And, and really, again, I was sad. I was mostly sad because I got caught. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't going to change because I didn't know how to first. Yeah. Um, but, but that's all I knew, you know? And so I just wanted, I just wanted what I wanted. And yeah. that's the way it was going. So, so yeah, no, I was, yeah, I was uh, fully full on. And then actually my ex-wife Kelly, she, you know, by the time I was 18, 19, you know, she, she actually helped me. She tried helping me, pulling me out of, you know, drinking all the time and, and things like so that. How old were you when you first got married? So I got married when I was 20. Okay. So 20. you, you guys have been dating for a while before. Yeah. I mean, okay. and it was, it was on again, off again. I broke up with her several times. Um, I mean, I was just a horrible person. And unfortunately looking at our relationship, um, she probably had some opportunities also to look at things that had happened in her life that mm -hmm. unfortunately drew her to probably a person like me. Mm. And it was just catastrophic for both of us really. So, yeah. Um, you know, ended up going to college and whatever. And, uh, I only went cause I thought my dad wanted me to go. And then somewhere through that, I was like, you know what? I, I actually can do this on my own. And I actually started excelling. But at 21, my brother, uh, I guess at some point prior to that, like six months prior to that, he heard about this guy named Jesus Christ. And he took me out one night. We drove around for like five hours. And he shared, he asked me tons of questions. He gave me tons of stuff. Honestly, I can't remember anything about the the interaction but what i do remember very vividly is at the very end he said well what do you think and i said i i, I don't know you know i really still i had no interest he said well well what do you have to lose and i was like I, I guess nothing, which again, looking back, I'm like, you lose your life. I mean, that's <laughs> it's kind of the biblical call, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I was like, well, I, I don't. And so he said, well, well, you know, and I can't remember at that point what he said, you know, do you accept Christ or whatever? And I said something to the effect of sure, why not? Mm -hmm. And so for the next, since from 21 to 36, I existed as a Christian. Um, and I tried, and guys, I tried really hard. You know, I, I read the Bible occasionally, you know, probably for the first year, I didn't tell soul that I was a Christian yeah, because I was embarrassed. Yeah. Uh, but then after that, I told somebody and it was like, Oh, shock is over. Okay. <laughs> somebody knows. And then, you know, from there I started reading the Bible and then, you know, eventually started going to church and, just as I was going through, you know, I, I would read certain things and, and Kelly would, would inform, you know, encourage me. She's like, 
hey, here is something that we, you know, you're doing wrong. And I would be even convicted by the sermon, you know, man, I know, I know that I'm doing that wrong. So I would try really, really hard. And I would fail miserably. And what I didn't see until probably just a couple years ago um, is what was happening is I was trying to live the Christian life by my own power. And of course, we know that that's impossible. Only Christ can live a Christ life. And that's the, the Holy Spirit that's dwelling in us. But I tried really hard. Well, what happened was, is I would clean all this stuff up. And God showed me this uh, scripture, and um, I can't remember where it is, but you, and I'm paraphrasing here, but basically the one where, you know, you clean your house and the spirit goes out into arid places and it goes around for a little while and you spend a lot of time cleaning your house and it's all cleaned up. And then that spirit grabs seven others, even more wicked than itself, and it comes back. And the state of that person is even worse than when they began. Mm -hmm. Guys, if I could chop up my life and show it to you every time I tried to clean myself up, it wasn't too much long later. I was almost seven times worse than I was before. It was wow. insane that I couldn't, I couldn't see it, you know, yeah. but the problem was, is everybody was telling me I was a Christian. What was, what was, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to interject because I have a question uh, that what, what was making you feel like that you were a failure as a Christian? What, what, where were you at? What were you, what, what kind of people were you around? What kind of environment were you around that were making you, that was making you to a point where you realize I'm, I'm failing. I'm not, I'm not living up to what it means. The Bible. The Bible. <laughs> so, <laughs> you, were just reading, you were just reading the Bible going, I'm a failure. <laughs> I'm, there's, there's stuff that isn't sinking up here. That will get you in trouble. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm reading the Bible and I'm like, okay, you know, maybe even off of a, something that the pastor said, I would go back, I would read right. that. Well, that, that was, I think that's where I was getting at. So I was, as, as, you know, were you in a church environment? Were you in a, a, some type of group environment that was just making you, you know, they were looking at you going, ah, you're not living up because you're not oh. doing this or because you're doing this or because you're doing that. No. Now, yeah. unfortunately, I, I didn't get really, really close to people because again, I'm still super codependent. Right. I mean, I, I haven't left any of the problems that I just described previously. Mm -hmm. They're all still blistering on top of me. I'm still massively codependent. I'm still in telling lies in every area of my life. I have a house of cards that I'm Jesus trying really point. hard to get somebody not to blow on, you know? So, yeah. I mean, life is very, very, very difficult. But on top of it, I am just hearing things. I'm getting convicted, you know, at church and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm talking to Kelly about it and she's like, what are you going to do about it? And I, I try really hard. And then whatever it is, three months, six months, whatever passes. And I fail because Kelly's able to point out to me, we talked about this. You were going to try this. You were, you know, you're going to try to drink less or whatever it was at the time. And you haven't been able to do it. And I'm like, oh, I just, I, you know, and I would, you know, I'm, I'm bummed out. I, I, I don't know why. And mm -hmm. I, that's just life. And I continue in this cycle of continually uh, going down, you know, because I figure at some point, and here's where I think the real pivotal and horrible thing is. At some point I got in my life where I got in my head that as I'm trying to do these things that are in the Bible and I keep failing because I do have someone that can confirm those things that are so, that's so close to me that I can't hide everything. She's so close. I can't hide it all. Right. And so I've got somebody telling me that, that at a point in my life, I decide, you know what, if I'm good, if I'm a bad person, I'm just going to be bad. <laughs> You know what? I'm just going to excel at being bad. I'm just going to do what I want. And, and again, this, these come from the roots of prior to 21 and, uh, you know, being 21 years old and hearing that I went through several phases. I mean, when I was a kid, I would definitely have considered myself to be an atheist. Um, as I moved into, you know, working and probably 14, 15, started listening to different music and things like that. 
Um, at one point, I would have definitely considered myself a Satanist. I did hang out with Satanists. Um, wow. And at one point, I did get invited to go to, I don't know what they were sacrificing. And I, I knew that at one point was something I was like, I'm not really sure about that. Well, that's neat. Um, and then after that, you know, I, I wasn't, you know, I, once I met Kelly, I kind of got into the point where I was like, okay, you know, I do want some things out of life and maybe this isn't the right. So those things kind of faded a little bit. And then I, at some point I would have probably not consider myself an atheist, but maybe atheist slash agnostic. So um, when I was younger, I definitely hated church. I saw all the people, you know, coming in and out of there and just the hypocritical things that I would hear about church people. Um, and I'm like, well, what makes you any better than me? You know, why, why do I even care? Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, uh, all these things are now feeding into this life where it's becoming absolutely and utterly unmanageable. And ultimately it gets the best of me. So I decide, you know, Hey, I'm, if, if I, if I can't be good, then I'm going to be bad. And so I just decide to go get whatever it is that I want. So I end up having my first affair. Um, and I just, I, I mean, looking back on it now, the amount of Just the amount of um, I don't even know what you would call it. The amount of evil that I could display and and I'm not gonna go into the depth of all the things that I said to Kelly or the things that I did after I even had the affair and things that I told people because because I'm really good at reading people I told everybody exactly what they wanted to hear and I was able just to make a new patched up thing and here's the crazy part guys somehow through all of this I was able to convince my wife at the time to not tell anybody the only people that knew were her and I, obviously the person that I cheated on with, and our counselor. Our best friends didn't know. Our parents didn't know. Nobody knew. Somehow I convinced her not to tell anybody. And I think that's one of the most damning things you can do to a person is ask them to keep a lie and live a double life for mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. um, I just... So, so that, that would, did that come from the sense that you have to be all things to all people? Absolutely. And so you were projecting I, I, that upon her to be well, all things to all and, people. And I don't want to make myself seem like a good person here because yes, I still had that. I did, you know, I wanted to be every, I, oh, ever since I was a little kid, I always wanted to help people. Mm -hmm. But ultimately at that point, I was just saving my butt. I was just doing whatever it was right. to, you didn't know how. to the yeah. next phase and the lack of emotion or feeling or any type of indication of humanity in me at that point, it still horrifies me to this day. Mm. I mean, I was like a walking calculating robot that would just, do whatever it needed to be done. So after that point, um, you know, it basically, I mean, I was still talking to the lady for a while. I mean, it, again, without her knowing, I mean, it, it was just insane. It was just insane. The double life. So again, that so you were, you were how, you were how far into your marriage when this happened? How, how many, how long were you married? 24. Let's see. Seven years, maybe. Okay. Something. I was thirty, so okay. six, seven years, something like that. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, thirty, thirty-one. So at that point, then you know, it just kind of dipped off, and life was just rough for a little while. I mean, mm -hmm. it was just we were just existing pretty much. Actually, yeah. And then um, 
I don't know. We, we had our second child, Reese, um, and I, you know, I'm not really sure. And I'm not actually even going to speculate why, you know, why, but in the middle of that, we ended up having another child, which I, I mean, I'm thankful for today, but it certainly wasn't out of, um, cause we were thriving as an right. marriage, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, um, so, you know, this is going on. And again, at this point, I still have spotty Christianity. I'm still, you know, and then after our second child, I basically got to the point where I'm like, okay, if this is going to be it forever, then I need, I need someone telling me how great I am again. So I went out and started looking for someone that was easy to tell me how great I am again. Mm. Um, and so I found that person and, you know, did whatever was necessary uh, to make sure that that was happening. And of course I wasn't, you know, I wasn't having fun at home, so I might as well have fun somewhere else. Um, and, and just basically living in absolute and utter sin. I mean, I, you know, I just, I know the words are kind of painting a picture, but I mean, it's, it's a hundred times worse than what you're imagining. Um, mm. It is. Avid. I'm not going to play the it's, hundred times worse it, challenge. It's, 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 <laughs> it's absolute depravity um, to, to the, to the fullest. And so, you know, I'm going along and uh, I, you know, I'm just, I'm, we're both tapped out and I don't even remember what happened, but she ended up buying a book um, that outlined um, having a um, separation and she had put it out and, you know, everything, and she didn't do anything with it for like, like, like a marital separation. Correct. Okay. And so she bought this book, had it out, you know, and I asked her even at one point, I'm like, did you read this or something? She's like, I don't ever read it. You know? So anyway, I got tired of it and I was like, well, I'm going to read it. So I read it and inside there, they had this contract that you draw up and all this stuff. So I, I went through and I drew up the contract and whatever, and I slapped it down. And I said, I think we was should, it, was it a Christian book? Secular. I, I don't know. Don't know. Okay. Good question. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, then, um, so we decided to separate and I remember walking into my parents' house one night and I sat down and I said, Hey, um, let me talk to you about something. They were like, Oh yeah, sure. You know? And again, keep in mind up to this point, nobody knows anything. Mm -hmm. Nobody has a clue that Kelly doesn't even know about the second person up to this point. Mm. So I walk into my parents' house and I'm like, hey, so Kelly and I are going to separate. I'm going to live here for two months. And I'll be moving in next Sunday. And they were like, what? <laughs> oh, man. And, um, you know, ultimately in that contract, and here's where, here's, so that's all, that's all the bad stuff, right? That, that's all the sinfulness. That's, that's what we're born into. And that's what we're predisposed to do unless Christ is actually present. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here's where Christ enters. And this is, this is where I owe him my very life. Okay. Let's, let's pause for yeah. just a second. Okay. Yeah. Cause <laughs> we've taken a lot of information and a lot of, and I, and I, 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 let's make this like a segue between yeah, what you've been through and to, to what's happening next. Sure. So you have, and Doug interject, if you've got any questions. So I want to make sure I understand this correctly. You've, you come out of a position where you feel like you're in a codependent relationship and that has caused you with you, with your mom. And that has caused you to look for codependency throughout your life. And so not only do you look for codependency, but you also have, look for that opportunity to be that person that someone needs throughout their life. And it's caused you naturally, it's caused you pain in your marriage. It's caused you pain in your life. It caused you, you at this point, you're addicted to alcohol, drugs. You're still at this point where we are right now in the story, you're still addicted to alcohol. Okay. Alcohol? okay. 
Okay. And so, and so you've been through this, you, you've been through an instance where you, your, your brother has talked to you about your brother or brother-in-law has talked to you about Christ, My right? brother, your brother. Mm-hmm. And so you're like, like most of us at that point, you're like, sure. What can, what can it hurt? And then you get to a place where you read, you're reading the Bible. If you go into church, you've seen these things and you realize I can't give up as much as I, or I can't, I can't live up to what all this says in scripture, what all these people are talking about. And then you dig in going, if I'm going to be bad, I'm going to be darn good at being bad. And I'm going to, I might as well be, if I'm going to sin. I might as well be good at it. Uh, I had a Bible professor, professor one time tell me that, Hey, if you're going to sin, you might as well be good at it. Just do it. What, what do you, what are you beating around the bush for? Quit. Yeah. Yeah. Quit uh, messing around. Yeah. Quit go. messing around. If you're going to sin, be good at it. Be a good sinner. You might as well be. I mean, if you're going to be good at something, ah, oh, man. Okay. All right. That's uh that's a lot to take in. I'm just, uh, I guess overall kind of blown away by the, all the strange kind of parallels and anti-parallels. I see there are so many things you said. It's like, I almost know what you're, how you're going to finish your sentence on some of this stuff. Yeah. Um, if, and, and, and here, let me just, I'll, I'll do what Mark did, but I'll do my, here's, here's what I'm hearing is I'm wondering, did you, did you, do you feel like you ever had like a superhero complex? Mm. Um, so maybe kind of so when i again when i was a kid i always wanted to help people help i always people. wanted yeah, that's... to be almost a rescuer you know mm-hmm. i wanted to make people feel and I, I wanted to make people feel great i wanted to help so so what so, you're doing yeah. is manufacturing basically mm-hmm. these scenarios that cast you in a hero spotlight Mm. I, I definitely made myself look like a hero for sure. Yeah. At um, the same time, internally, you know that's not the truth. That's not true. That's yeah. the duplicity. <laughs> yeah. You're you're putting yeah. on this show for everybody. Yeah. And you're keeping them entertained mm-hmm. and you're keeping them tied in. Yeah. And they're giving you that affirmation you want. Absolutely. But internally, that duplicity is something you can't live with. Absolutely. And that's what's it's not really me. That's what starts to tear things in part. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's, that's, that's where, and to me, that's where Christ finds entry is mm-hmm. when that, when that, ah, you know, that veil starts to get ripped into yeah. That's where he goes. Ta da. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. And it's like, okay, okay. I know everything's hard. Tell me what the Bible says. I'm going to do it. Just tell me what to do. Just tell me what to do. You know, everybody's had the, the, the prayer to Jesus over the porcelain altar. You know what, midnight? Just get me out of this. I'll never do it again. I yes. I promise I'll never yeah. do it again. <laughs> we'll never do it again. It's that, it's that moment of ag- agony that brings us to our knees. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Oh man. But okay. Ahead, so man, this is riveting. I'm sorry. I'm normally Mark can tell you, I normally can't shut up and I'm, I'm just totally glued into your story. And he's you. like, let's take a segue. I have questions. I'm like, no, <laughs> shut up and let him finish. <laughs> no, let's take a moment and breathe. Just I breathe know. for a second because we're, yeah. All right. So, okay. So all this, you come to your parents' house, you're like, Hey, we're Kelly and I are going to split up. I'm going to live with you for two months. And then Christ enters for a second time this and, is the second oh, coming oh, of christ let me let me interject one okay more, go ahead just Sorry. just for stupidity's okay. sake no <laughs> such thing that's what i'm here for um you you were talking about uh the the being evil and uh, this is a this is a conversation i've had with people over and over again do you suppose that any part of my misery on earth is because i keep trying to be a hero and i'm really supposed to be a villain Mm. And if I would just give in and be a villain, then everything would go smoothly and easily. When I was uh, between the ages of high school and after high school, I, you've heard many fun stories about buttons on my jacket. I had a button that used that said, Jesus died for my sins. I'm making sure he got his money's worth. <laughs> and I wore that proudly. Oh, I, mean, wow. I was not pretending to be a Christian at all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was that was the same sentiment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You're like, hey. I'm, I'm wow. Right. Okay. All right. I I feel like I feel like this deserves a moment just to pause over this. Not not over your button. I like. Oh, that. good. Thank you. Like, <laughs> not over the button, that's... but what you said just before that, because that was the comedic part that made me think. Wow, that was hilarious. The gentle mentor. <laughs> <laughs> 